Welcome to the podcast, Lighting the Educational Flame, created and produced by educator and author Mark Hoberman, owner and director of Grade Success Tutoring. Mark will be joined by Susan Brender, CEO and host of The Susan Brender Show. The purpose of this program is to offer our listeners a variety of stories dealing with many interesting topics surrounding education. It is our hope that students and parents alike will benefit from the wide range of topics, including study skills, test prep, and anti-bullying, sports, music, and more. We hope you enjoy our show, Lighting the Educational Flame. Hello and welcome to the video podcast, Lighting the Educational Flame, brought to you by Great Success Education on the NETV Network. I am Mark Hoberman, and my co-host is Susan Brender. How are you doing today, Susan? It's absolutely a pleasure. I'm doing so fine, and I'm so delighted that I'm doing this with you today, Mark. Great to have you, as always. Today, our guest is, among many other things, the former Delray Education Board Chair. We're pleased to have Mitch Katz here with us. Mitch, welcome to our show. Thank you. Can you tell us, Mitch, how you became involved in education and what led you uh, to be part of the Education Board in Delray? Sure. So, um, so the educate, I'm going to explain a little bit about, first of all, I worked in, I've been working in higher education for the last, I want to say 14 or 15 years. Um, I worked in mostly online uh, graduate degree programs, helping adults go back to school, get their degree, teachers, that kind of thing. Um, but I was a parent um, in Delray Beach and wanted to get involved in local boards. Um, in Delray, we have uh, an education board, but we're not the board of education. Right. So in Delray Beach, our schools are managed and run by the Palm Beach County School Board. Okay. Um, but our Delray Beach board really is a filling gap, really helping the underserved in our community and helping uh, those kids like after school reading, bringing up the um, uh, reading scores, um, doing the um, summer uh, reading programs, so that the, um, the kids didn't lose a lot over the summer, the gap. A matter of fact, the board that I was on, we worked on the uh, third grade reading campaign that helped us win our third um, All-America City Award. Okay. You know, I'm gonna jump in, Mark, because what I wanna know from you, Mitch, is that we're dealing with a very different time. And, yes. you know, schools are closed. Um, some of them might be opening, but the reality is that kids and parents have to be on the computer in order to do anything. And how has that changed for the educational system? Well, I think it's changed tremendously. Um, you know, we have, I, my two kids right now are at home, um, going to school full time. Uh, we actually have to make a decision this week. Do we want to keep them home through the end of January, uh, which is the end of the next the semester, you know, or send them back? Um, and then there's, there, you, you have to make a choice. When What happened was originally when the schools were going to open up, which they delayed the opening, they said, okay, you have to choose between online or at home, um, but you could always switch back and forth. So say you sent them to school and you said, you know, we're not feeling safe. We want to bring them home. You could do that. Now, after a couple of weeks of them going to school, they want more surety and certainty for the teachers because that's the teachers right now are in a real pickle, you know, because if they, they are forced right now basically to go to school, even if there's only one kid in their class. So if there's only going to be one class for the next semester, they're saying, well, why don't we maybe move that kid to another class and let that teacher that is maybe a little more vulnerable stay home. Gotcha. So things have gotten, and, and then the, what, who's really hurting from this pandemic more than anybody is the poor and underserved. So these kids don't have the, I mean, we're very fortunate. My wife stays at home. I'm an educator. Um, you know, they're getting a lot of support and they've always gotten a lot of support. Those kids that don't have the home support depend on after school programs. They, they depend on these other programs that are just not where they, first of all, they're just getting going again. They're not where they need to be. Um, and that's, um, and it always hurts the most needed is the one not getting it. And then you throw into the mix the special needs students who, who need and do get that support in the school. 
Yeah. And uh, it becomes a, a great challenge. I want to talk about an, another challenge, actually, Mitch. What, what's the greatest challenge you've seen between communicating with teachers and administrators? I've been a teacher. Uh, I've been a union rep and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. But there's sometimes a little problem with the communication between teachers and administrators. And as a person who sits on that type of board in the past, what's the greatest challenge you've seen? I mean, I will just tell you, just as a parent, it's, it's been difficult. You know, you have some parents, some teachers that are uh, very... Um, extra communicative and really getting to you what's going on with their grades and, you know, assignments. And then you have some that aren't. Um, and then, so the, the communication is a huge piece. And that's um, really, it falls on the teachers because us as parents, we don't know how to go on and see like their Google classroom, right. what's turned in, what's not turned in. And they use this, what they call SIS here in Palm Beach County that, okay. It shows their grades, but if teachers are two or three week, weeks behind in putting their grades up, you don't know, you know, they're in their room and they're doing the work in front of the computer. You think they're doing it. <laughs> right. right. Yeah, you said, you, you said something really r right because one doesn't really know what's no. going on. I we mean, don't this know. is the one of the issues, the, right? The teachers are the only ones really that know what's going so, on. And they've got to do a better job in general in communicating that to the parents. And again, we are parents that are involved. So we're asking the question. So we're looking yeah, at looking. the grades and saying, well, there's three zeros here. What happened? Well, I turned it in, right? And then we're reaching out to the teacher as a parent. Right. Think about the underserved kids where the parents got three jobs right. or, you know, or, a, or, or like in Delray Beach where we are, a lot of them have language barriers. We have a huge Haitian population, right? So. Yeah. They're, they're afraid to reach out or even know how to reach out. Those yeah. kids really are struggling. What's, what's your thoughts, if you will, um, about the direction education has taken in the last five years? Um, in general, like K-12 education? Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. I think it's, so I, I'm, I'm kind of torn. I think public education is extremely important, but I think that the schools the school boards and the, the school systems need to catch on to what the charter schools and the private schools are doing. They need to market themselves better. They need, they need to, instead of looking like we're the alternative that we should be and just lobbying and hiring lobbyists and, and, and trying to outvote politicians, I think they should be making themselves better where as a parent, we want to choose that public school over a charter school or et cetera. Right. Because right now it's become where, you know, they just think they're the, they should be the school of choice automatically where they need to have the mentality that they should be competing for that student like a private school would or a, you know, university would. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm very interested in understanding what initiatives you've taken during your um, time on the board because needless to say these are you know you're a pretty interesting guy and I'm sure that you have ideas and things that you want to discuss with our audience about some of the initiatives you've taken. Right so a lot of the initiatives we took was this third grade reading campaign. Um, for children if you if you don't if a child does not know how to read by the time they're in third grade their chance of graduating high school is diminished by hundreds of percentage. So it really um, um, becomes a huge problem if those kids cannot are not at reading level by third grade. That's the benchmark. If we can do everything we can from the time they're born until third grade to get them up to that level, then we have a chance of them succeeding. And a lot, of, especially here, it's a lot of poverty. Um, I, there's a saying I always say, poverty begets poverty right? It is almost impossible for a child to get out of poverty. There's only one way, and it's through education. Now, there is one in a million children will get a football scholarship and go to the NFL. Right. That's literally one in probably 100,000 or more. Right. Exactly. Um, any real chance for them to get out of poverty is through education. So we really started with this third grade reading campaign that had a lot of elements. Number one, it had summer education programs. So we started it at the elementary schools where over the summer, the kids could get a scholarship and go to the summer program. And then we incorporated that program at all of the city camps as well, all the city camps. 
So in other words, if kids used to just go to a, like a rec camp during the summer where they're just playing every day, they would actually have an education component into that summer program. And that summer gap, that summer lapse is huge. So we saw actually what we, what's very unique, Delray Beach was able to have a interlocal agreement with the school district, like I mentioned. We're not the school, we don't run the schools, right? We do every, we can only help them outside of that eight to two time period. So we had an interlocal agreement with the school district. So we could test these kids at right before they left and test them when they came back. When we started out, these kids were losing anywhere from 10 to 30% um, in their reading levels and math, other scores, right? That summer gap the kids that were going through the summer programs actually improved by the time they got back. So they learned more than they, than losing over that summer. And those were, those were huge gains in getting these, these children up to. Really Let me jump in there for a second. You mentioned uh, several things that were so important. First thing is that I hope people realize that Mitch said that if they don't get to the right reading level by third grade, they lower their percentage of graduating high school. He didn't say graduating in time. He said graduating period. Oh, period. And that is so true. Uh, and so, you know, that's an important thing. You know, great success education that I own is also a tutoring service. And the, the numbers he, he mentioned are so staggering, troubling, and on point because the average student loses 15 to 20% of his or her reading ability over the summer. And they get it back sometime in September, October. But these kids were not really in school in March, April, May, June, even September, and now in October. So that kind of program that he just spoke about is a tremendous, tremendous uh, thing to do because that's the, education is the panacea. We all know it. It's, you know, it, it is what it is. I'm looking forward to the day when they, can, they have to run a bake sale to get weapons and <laughs> we have all the money we need for education. But uh, you know, in, in talking about that, I want to bring over education to something else that's sometimes a barrier. And I want Mitch's thoughts on this. When I started teaching 35 years ago, I had no idea how political education could be. My friends said, are you sure you want to be a teacher? Uh, it's so political. I said, what do you mean political? I close the door <laughs> and I teach. Boy, were they right and boy, was I wrong. I was naive. I thought that I could just close my door and do my magic and whatever I wanted to do. So I've often found that politics and education, they often kind of go hand in hand. What are your thoughts on that? Well, they absolutely go hand in hand. I mean, every matter of fact, it's interesting is I, I served on the education board where we could actually do something to help oh, those kids. Um, and then I served on the city commission where as a commissioner, we really did not, that's not one of the, it's not really a budget item for the city education. So there's little we could do. Yet um, when I lost, I lost my reelection. The biggest thing my opponent tried running on that he was going to improve education when he has no control over education. Um, because the word education in politics is a hot topic. And what I noticed too, when I went out and talked to people, um, whether I was on the commission um, or I was serving on the education board, when you talk to people, you would think that, so in Delray Beach, we have a lot of older populations, um, 55 older communities. And I would go talk to 55 and older communities and ask them, what's on your mind? You know, what is your concerns about the city? Do you know what the number one question they asked about? How much? I don't think it was education. I think it, it was, was education. education. At 55 they, plus, that's it. They have no children living that's in the city. That's what I was going to say. Yep. Right. Their number one concern were the kids that live in the city. That's wonderful. That's, that's it, great it, news. It, great news. It was I, really, that's where people, people get it. They know, especially the older generations, know that education is where they got to where they are. Oh, absolutely. And they know that that's how they can, that's what's most important. Even if it's not, they, I mean, I thought I was going to get questioned about, you know, parking or, or, you know, traffic. And the question was, every time, education was always the number one question, question they asked. That brings up a point, uh, Mitch. And the point is that in Florida, Florida's school system has a relatively bad reputation. Now, we're not ashamed. relatively. <laughs> okay. Reputation. Okay. So let me know, because that's what I Better heard. he said it. Okay. The yeah. Host, the host shouldn't say it. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. I mean, remember, remember one thing. We're a show that is shown all over the world. So I'm interested in understanding why we have such a low standard, such a low standard. I don't know if it's a low standard, but we have a low 
um, agreement. So we have, we, again, it goes back to politics. You have, you have one party saying, this is how you need to educate everybody. And you have another party saying, this is how you have to educate everybody. Yeah, absolutely. And nobody wants to meet in the middle. Nobody wants to come and say, okay, how can charter schools and public schools work together in a community to serve every child and do it effectively? Nobody wants to talk to each other. I mean, somebody runs for school board and they say, well, I think that's a good charter school. They're cooked. Because right. the union's going right. to come after them. The, you know, the, everybody's going to, oh, my God, how dare you support that charter school, even if it's a good thing. You know, and then we have choice. So Florida is also a state. And if you notice, a lot of states with really bad education were previously segregated states. Um, Florida, Mississippi, Alabama. Look at, we all rank around the same bottom 10 all the time, right? And it has a lot to do with that pre-segregation and never truly integrating education. What they did in Florida, in South Florida in particular, um, and I think pretty much the whole state, is what you call voluntary integration, right? So you had choice programs. And it helps to a point. But then when you go in the school and you really dig into the school, you end up with divided schools. So you'll have the kids that are, you know, from the affluent communities on one side of the school, and then the kids that are in the poor community on the other side of the school, and they're not really integrated at all. But it, it really comes down to is people need to stop the, like the D and the R and, and go with the C, children, <laughs> right. right? And that's yeah. what they need to start thinking about, and they don't. And it's all about whatever the political, you know, like, you know, most, Dem and I'll, I'll, I'll put parties out there, most Democrats, dislike charter schools. Republicans are known for loving charter schools. Do you know who created the charter schools? No clue. The Democrats. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then, you know, you heard of the, um, the, the big program that was national that, um, that um, the, where every state was supposed to have the same standards, the core, common, core, common, core, right? common core. Common core. Common core. Common core is awful. I mean, really the Republicans came out and said, this is the worst thing ever. Do you know who created Common Core? Probably the Republicans. Republican-led <laughs> Governors Association. Right. Mm -hmm. So both programs that are awful to those parties were created by those parties because yeah, well, they can't figure out how to work with the other side and right. come somewhere in the middle. Well, this is Common frustrating. Core makes sense. Absolutely. It should be four plus four is eight in every state. Yeah. Well, you mentioned <laughs> something that really feeds to the frustration that parents have because they don't know what's going on in the schools even before the pandemic. Now they know less. Now sometimes their kids are more adept technologically than they are. So what do you think, what's the best way for parents to be advocates for, for their children? Number one is they've got to pay attention. They've got to, and, and you had to pay attention before, increase that by 1000%. So you used to maybe check things every semester, check them every week. You've got to be on top of things because once a child gets behind on their subjects and their grades and their, you know, they're having to do a lot of, not only they having to pay attention in their class that they have in right now, most of the time it's, it's asynchronous. So they have to be there a certain time, but they're also given, if they're reading, maybe they're giving reading plus they're getting these online um, tools that they have to use and do and keeping on top of that. Are they really doing that? So to me, that's the big thing. These parents have to check in with the kids and the teachers regularly. Do not depend on those teachers to communicate to you. So consistency you know, for sure. I agree. Mark, I, I want to, I'm sure that you've experienced this and so has Mitch, but I'm going to ask the question anyway. And that is, why don't we teach our kids civics? I mean, <laughs> you were a politician and you were a teacher and you have a mentorship problem, a problem. I hope it's not a problem <laughs> in program, but the, this, the sense of understanding what's going on in our world and what's going on in our city and our states to me, that's very important. Why is that not taught anymore? So it is taught. Right. First of all, it is taught. I know that seems to be a myth. I always read on social media. They don't say the Pledge of Allegiance. It's a lie. They do. Um, they don't teach civics. They do. Now, do they teach it as much? You know, do we have, I remember elementary school, we used to always have chorus and we learn all the patriotic songs. 
I don't think my kids did learn those same songs anymore, right. but um, they, they do learn basic civics. They're having to learn local government. They're learning um, history. They're learning um, state government, federal government. Um, and I know for my teacher, matter of fact, um, I think it's, and they, and they do it by grades, you know, so I know in certain grades, I think it's seventh grade, they teach um, city government. And I've taught, I've come in and talked to classes during that time. Um, in elementary school, they do it, I think, in fourth grade. Right. And I know, like, I, I've been to a fourth grade class. And I remember when my son was in fourth grade, I wasn't on the commission. I had the mayor come and talk to his class, you know, um, because it was part of the curriculum. Right. And in high school, I know they do participate, participation in government. It's never enough in the curriculum, you know, is different. You can't be guaranteed it's taught one way in one class and one school and one district. And then you talk about different states. Uh, so there's, so here, there's a lot here's about what that. happened in Florida. There's a recent change here. There, so everything is tested right now. They have to take tests. Your schools are graded. Um, the governor did add last year, or the year before, where they now are tested actually in civics. I don't know. I can't remember what grade level but they do have to take an end of the year test, at least in one grade level um, for civics, which is something new. So, and that's why you say where sometimes it gets cut out of the curriculum. If you've only got so many days and they've got, this is what they have to pass the test. Oh yeah. You know, Teach science, it to the test and they have a curriculum math, and you got to go English, one week and you got to be ready. Civics aren't on the test. It's going to be the last to get taught. Correct. We're teaching to the so test. It's being added time. to the testing now. All right. Well, uh, so, so Mitch, what can you tell us about if people want to learn more about you and what you've done, what you're, you're doing in the future, where can they find out more <laughs> about you? Um, I do have a, a Facebook page, uh, Mitch okay. Katz. On, it's actually called Delray Politics by Mitch Katz. Okay. Um, and I actually do a weekly um, uh, uh, Zoom on local Delray Beach issues, which has been really interesting uh, Excellent. the last few months. Excellent. See, Susan, with competition. So <laughs> thing. But it's um, very, it's very, yours is nationwide. This is very centric right. just to the city of Delray Beach because gotcha. our local politics makes New York and Chicago look like nothing. Wow. Interesting. So look, every, <laughs> everybody has, has, has their different problems, but Mitch, really, Susan and I can't thank you enough for being with us today. Oh, she, thanks for having me. It was thank fun. You, thank you. Thank you. And uh, uh, also look for great success for our viewers on Facebook and Twitter. We'd love to hear from you. You can also find me, Mark Hoban, on LinkedIn. Again, Mitch Katz, thanks for being with us. Susan, as always, thanks to you. Thank you. I want to good remind meeting you, you both. Thank you. The, to the viewers, don't forget Pleasure. to tune in to our next podcast. This is Mark Hoberman thanking you for watching the podcast, Lighting the Educational Flame on the Great Success Education Channel on NETV. Have a great day. Thank Have you so much. Have a great much. day. Thank you for listening to Lighting the Educational Flame with Mark Hoberman. To contact Mark, email him at info at gradesuccess.com.